vegetable stew. On Saturdays in the summer, it wasn't so good. There was never anything to do. There wasn't any football up the park. It was too hot to go to the pictures. Not that they wouldn't have liked to go to the pictures, but Smitty's mother and father wouldn't let them go when the weather was fine. There was no bagsing on the porch because there was nothing worth bagsing. Usually when things were like this, they would gradually drift somewhere or other. Not anywhere they wanted to go, but just somewhere they seemed to go without quite knowing why. It would happen while they talked. Someone would start walking or running or perhaps kicking a ball, and soon they were all drifting somewhere. Perhaps it was a dog fight around the corner that started them off. There were some great dog fights there too. In the corner house, Mr Delaney's place, there was a great big dirty mud black Alsatian which barked at everything and everybody that went by. Bryn used to get pretty scared and run past the house as quick as he could go. One day the postman saw him doing this and called after him. Don't run, sonny. There's nothing to be frightened about. Dogs won't hurt you. Just pat them and they're friendly. Yep, called Bryn, and he went on running. About a week later, someone in Delaney's left the gate open, and the Alsatian was running out loose, so none of the street was around. They were all scared, and watched from a distance as the Alsatian went rushing about at the end of the street. For a while they hung over Gourmet's gate, wondering what they could do with the dog out there. They were getting tired of it when... Listen, said Smitty. There's the postman's whistle. Now we'll see what happens, says Bryn. A few moments later, the postman turned the corner and came down the street. The Alsatian sighted him from afar, and with a curdling wolf cry, made a beeline towards him. The postman, seeing him coming, and realising that the dog meant business, threw his bag on the ground and turned in flight. But he had not gone two yards when the Alsatian was at his behind. Rip! The whole back of his trousers came off in the dog's mouth. At the same moment, and with a mighty yell, the postman, now showing a white rear, sprang up over the nearest fence, with the Alsatian snapping at his feet as he disappeared from sight. Boy, said Bryn, how do you like that? Dogs won't bite you, not half. Well, on this particular Saturday, after the dog was chained up, they had all started to drift, but they hadn't gone far. Horsey had started it by trying to tightrope down the path rail, like the chap did in Worth's circus. The rail was round, so it was pretty tough, and after he had gone a few yards, everybody else followed him. So away they all went, one after the other, moving along the path rail, about twenty yards from the bottom. Horsey, who was now moving much faster to keep ahead of the others, suddenly slipped and went smack right on the footpath. They all jumped down, gathered around, and pulled him to his feet. You all right? said Smitty. Oh, gee, said Horsey. My leg. They all looked at his leg. It was pretty badly grazed. Oh, you better go get it fixed up, said Gormy. Yeah, we'll wait for you here, said Smitty. That was as far as they drifted this Saturday morning. But they still didn't know what they were going to do when Horsey came back. Meanwhile, Smitty and Gormy started to make some little roads of clay in the end of the bank while Bryn just sat at the top, pulling pieces of stone and clay, and throwing them at a lamppost a few yards away. Gormy was the tram driver, and Smitty was a bus driver. They passed each other again and again, up and down the little clay roads, and now and again they would have a traffic jam. They didn't have to make all the roads this morning, because they had been there before, and the roads and some caves and tunnels were already pretty well made. Often, they would bring down one or two little motor cars that had been given for their birthdays or Christmas, and run these along the roads. But this morning, they didn't have any of these with them, so they had to use bits of hard brick and pretend. Gormy had a long piece for a tram, and Smitty had a flat, wide piece for a bus. Just then, Bryn hit the sign on the lamppost with the name of the street on it, and a piece of mud flew off and hit Smitty on the head. Hey, cut out! What are you doing? Smitty growled. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to hit you. And he went straight on throwing bricks at the signpost which was pretty much chipped about by years of brick throwing. Another piece of mud hit Smitty. If you hit me again, I'll come up there and bash you. Smitty and Gormy were having a crash between the tram driver and the bus driver. The bus had rolled over down a steep mountainside of loose clay and gone over and over and into the gutter far below. Wish we had your ambulance here to pick all the dead people up, said Smitty. That'd be good, all right, said Gormy, but it doesn't go anymore. They couldn't have the ambulance because Gormy had pulled it to bits to see what had made it go about a week after his big brother had given it to him for his birthday. 
He hadn't been able to make it go after that. I wouldn't mind if you'd learnt something by doing that, his big brother had said. But you don't. You just pull everything you get to pieces, just for the sake of pulling it to pieces. It's mine, isn't it? demanded Gormi. Right, his brother said, but no more presents for you. And he had said the same thing before, so Gormi didn't care much. Out of 40 shots, Ron had now hit the sign 14 times, which wasn't bad going. He had a big handful of stones in his hand, ready for the next stone throwing. When the baby Austin went past quickly down the street, and BANG! Without warning, Ron threw the whole handful of stones at the car. It was a straight shot, a hit on the bonnet and windscreen. Away Bryn ran. Away up the bank, flat out. He was gone. Gormy looked at Smitty in surprise. What did he do that for? I don't know, said Smitty. Look, the cars stopped. And off they went, up the path, as fast as Bryn had gone before them. The car stopped at the end of the street, turned around, came back to where they'd been playing. A man climbed out, and looked around, and walked up the path. Bryn tore around the side of his place, and crept into the house, and hid under the breakfast table, without his mother seeing him. It was dark and hard there, and he lay down with his head on the prickly carpet, smelling the carpet smell, and breathing quickly and quietly to himself. Then, Smitty came running in with Gormy. Hey mum, Bryn threw some bricks at a car going by, and the fella stopped. He's coming up the hill. Goodness gracious, said Mr Smith. What did he do that for? We don't know, said Smitty. Do we, Gormy? So where is he now? asked Mr Smith. He came in here, said Smitty. He must be hiding somewhere. They started to search for him in the house. But just then, the front doorbell rang. Mrs Smith went to the door. Smitty and Gormy listened from the next room, but they couldn't hear it very well. When the man had gone, she came back. My word, that boy's going to get it from his father, she said. Didn't break anything, fortunately, but he did dent the car bonnet. Heck, said Smitty. Hey, look, there he is. They'd just seen Bryn crouching under the table next to the wall. Come out of here immediately, said Mrs Smith. Go and wait in the bathroom till your father comes home at lunchtime. She smacked him on the legs as he scuttled past her. Went into the bathroom, shut the door, climbed out the window. For that, he got an even harder hiding when his father came home for lunch. After lunch, they still hadn't decided what to do. Horsey, who now had a bandage on his leg, thought it would be all right swimming, but the others didn't. Horsey could swim, they couldn't. Smitty hated swimming, especially since he nearly drowned last time they went down to the beach. There was another day when the wind was spitting along the shore with little gusts of sand, and the water was as cold as the dickens. Horsey had swum out to the pier and was calling the others to come. Come on, it's good out here, he shouted. Oh yeah, yelled Gormy. But they all stood on the edge, holding their arms over their bare sides because the wind was that cold. Hey look, there's those Faraday jokers, said Gormy. We'd better go in, said Smitty, or else they'll come and chuck sand at us. Oh, you go first then, said Gormy. You can swim a bit, and I can't at all. Smitty advanced into the water, bit by bit, crept slowly up his legs, seizing his muscles higher and higher until it hit his stomach with an ugh, and he wriggled and shivered to the shoulders. And he went out further and further, holding his arms above his head, stepping right up on tiptoes, hoping he would be able to reach the pier without swimming at all. It was low tide. When the water was up to his mouth, he'd only had about three yards to go. He plunged forward towards the bottom rung of the pier ladder, splashing and swiping the water. Just as he was going to grab it, a great big surf club fellow with his head in the water swooped up to the pier and knocked Smitty backwards before he could grasp the rung. Oh, help! cried Smitty. <coughs> Caught hold of the surf club fellow and pulled him under with him as he fell back. Smitty came to the surface, fighting for breath and kicking wildly and frantically. Bobbing up and down, swallowing more water than air, he desperately tried to kick himself back to the land. What the blazes you think you're doing? yelled the surfer as he regained the ladder. But Smitty wasn't taking any notice of him. He was all out sloshing back for the beach. After nearly getting drowned like that, and partly because the Faraday gang were always on the beach, Smitty and the others only went down there when it was really too hot to do anything else. Today it wasn't that hot. It was dry and windy rather than hot. For a while they mucked around with roads they'd been working on before lunch, but gradually they drifted up the street towards the hills. Smitty took a step back from the bank to look at the roads. Gormy took a step back from the bank to look at the roads. Bryn took two steps back. Horsey took three steps back. And that's how it started. In a moment, they were out of the street. 
happen without them realizing it had happened. Let's see if we can find that hidden fort the Faradays are always skiding they've got up there, said Gormy. Joe Faraday at school reckons they go up there every Sunday and they keep all their things hidden in there. They're rotten jokers they are, said Smitty. It'd be good if we could wreck their fort. I'll say, said Horsey, and they all started to move faster up the road towards the hill. Nobody was just drifting now. They all knew what they were heading for. When they reached the track through the gorse onto the hill, they went into single file. Smitty, Gormy, Horsey and Bryn, moving silently, not talking. On the top of the hill, they kept down, out of sight. Gormy pointed out the clump of gorse that he thought they would find the fort. That part over there, in the patch of sun, he said, with all the yellow bloom and the burnt part up, right up above the, to the right. They all moved, hunched up, down the hill, and using the bushes and gorse to hide them as much as possible. Smitty was leading, and he made a wide detour right, round the back of the gorse patch, to make sure there was no one approaching from any other direction. As they crawled near, they could not see anyone. Oh, they're probably at the pictures, whispered Gormy. They usually go there every Saturday afternoon. We'll all crawl opposite ways round the gorse, said Smitty, and see if we can find the entrance. It was hard to find, and they were about an hour going round and round before Bryn finally found it. Oh, you have to get right down on your stomach to get in, he said. And they all went back to the place where he had found the entrance, and crawled in. It was a long, low tunnel, full of dry prickles and branches which pushed in your face. At the end of this tunnel, surrounded by gorse bushes, with a clearing, partly open to the sky, partly covered with sacks, with a few boxes to sit in. This was the fort, all right. In one of the boxes, there were old newspapers and some magazines. There were some empty fizz bottles in one corner. Anything worth having? asked Gormy. Mm, doesn't seem to be, replied Horsey. Phew, trip for nothing, said Smitty. Thought you said they kept a lot of stuff here. Oh, that's what they reckoned, said Gormy. But they're such terrible liars. Let's burn the whole show down. Got some matches. Oh, it's a bit dangerous, protested Smitty. Might catch the whole hill. Oh, let's just wreck it up then, said Horsey. All right, here goes. And they all started throwing everything everywhere. Nothing was heard about the wrecking of the fort for a few days. Though Gormy had said the Faraday brothers had been moaning about it at his school. You didn't tell them we did it, did you? Asked Smitty. Oh, of course I didn't, said Gormy. But they came to me and reckoned it was us that did it. Ha, huh, we'll see what they've got to say next Saturday morning, said Smitty. Every Saturday morning, the two Faraday brothers delivered the vegetables for their father in a small handcart. They had several customers in their street, and they usually came along there. Well, next Saturday morning, when the Faradays arrived with their cart, for all our street was sitting on the bank, dangling their legs over the top. Their hands were full of bricks. From up above, they gazed steadily and quietly down at the Faradays. They came along the road. As soon as Joe Faraday saw them, he called out, Hey, you up there! You called Smith! It was you that wrecked our fort, wasn't it? it? Makes you so sure, yelled back Smitty. We know, said Joe. We never knew you had a fort, let alone that it had been wrecked, sneered Horsey. You're a liar, called Mike Faraday. You, yelled Joe. Well, see if you like this, said Horsey, and he hurled several bricks, one after the other, down at the Faradays. That started all of them. They spread out along the bank and let go with clay, mud and stones. Gormy fired from the left, Horsey and Bryn from the centre, and Smitty from the right. The two Faradays fired back up at them from the road, picking up stones where they could, but they didn't have a show. After they had been hit several times, they lost their tempers, began to throw vegetables from their barrow. They let fly with apples, oranges, potatoes, carrots and cucumbers. Gormy and the others sent them back at double speed. The fight continued, and the Faradays fighting from behind their barrow for protection. Then for a while, they were silent behind their cart, crouching out of sight, while the street watched from the bank top, munching pears and apples as they did so. Then, deciding that they'd had enough, the Faradays jumped out suddenly, seized the handles of their cart, and rushed off without delivering any of their vegetables. Gormy fired a few parting shots, but not many, because Smitty and the others were scrambling down the bank to pick up what remained of the good fruit. Gormy was right after them. 
When they had all collected a shirt full each, they scrambled up on top of the bank again and sat there in the sun, eating the spoils. Well, we got something out of the fort after all, said Smitty. Even though we did have to wait a week to get it.